Well, it is 7 o'clock. We welcome you to this November the 28th, 2017 City Council. Uh, we welcome all that are here. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to recognize that uh, we have on the phone um, Remy Drapkin, uh, a council person who is on the phone and is with us. Um, and so with that being said, uh, also, we do have a public hearing a part of tonight's uh, 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 proceedings, and we do have a sign up if you'd like to speak during the public hearing. There are um, sign up uh, cards at the very back, and if you could bring those up uh, before we get to the public hearing, we'd appreciate that. With that being said, uh, let's go ahead and we'll start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and Councilor uh, President uh, Mankey will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we've come to that portion of our meeting this evening that we have an invitation to citizens for public comment. And you may speak on any topic other than a topic that is already on the agenda, a matter that is in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter that's scheduled for a public hearing at some future date, including the one that we will have tonight. Uh, we will limit the comments to three minutes um, and so would anyone like to speak to the council in our comments section this evening? I'll call one more time. Anyone that would like to um, speak to the council in our public comments section tonight? Go ahead. Come on up. Are we going to talk about uh, recology and rate increase? Yes. That, that is what the public hearing is for tonight. So, you'll, you, yeah, you'll have to wait till public hearing. Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and we will close our uh, public comment section this evening. Um, this evening, we are going to have a public hearing, and I will turn some time over to City Attorney David, David Kosh to talk to us about the public hearing. Tonight's public hearing is advertised is to consider a proposal from Recology Inc. Uh, related to the location for the disposal of solid waste under the city's exclusive franchise agreement with Recology. Thank you. Uh, we have public comment cards, as the mayor noted. Um, if you wish to speak during the public hearing, um, either for or against, please fill out a public co a comment card. There are uh, located a couple different places in the back of the room there. Um, if you haven't already turned one in, the mayor will call you up to give your testimony. We ask that you limit it to three minutes. Um, we don't want to discourage anyone from giving their public comment, uh, but we would ask that you try to avoid being unnecessarily redundant. So if a previous speaker has, has said exactly what you believe and want to say, feel free to um, say that you agree with them, um, but also you've got the three minutes of your time uh, for yourself to, to speak as well. Um, and then following that, the council will close the public hearing and the action items related to this matter will appear later on on the agenda tonight. Thank you, David. Uh, before we open the, the public hearing this evening, uh, we'd like to call on uh, Walter and Dave from uh, Recology. Uh, they have a presentation for us. We've asked them to, uh, to address us before we start our public hearing. So Walter and David, anyone else you'd have uh, with you? Again, these two are just responding to a request from the city uh, to talk to us a little bit about the, those items that are going to be on in the public hearing, but specifically the cost of transferring uh, garbage to another location other than River Bend. So thank you, guys. Thank you, Mayor Hill. Uh, my, my name is Walter Budzik, and I'm the accountant for Recology Western Oregon. I've never been in front of you before, so Hold I thought I'd... Just a little closer. Thought I'd maybe, oh, maybe. maybe introduce myself uh, first. Uh, Dave and I, uh, we're sorry that uh, Carl wasn't able to make it tonight. 
um, but Dave and I are here to answer any of your questions you might have about the proposal. Um, so uh, as City Attorney Kosh uh, stated, we submitted a proposal to the city to reroute the McMinnville trash tons to an alternate disposal site. Uh, we have selected Cowlitz County Landfill near Kelso, Washington as that site. The cost of this proposal is a 10% increase in rates. If the city elects to accept the proposal, Recology will forego the scheduled uh, July 2000, 2018 rate review. Uh, An adjustment would not be submitted for rate uh, proposal until July of 2019. Uh, there were some questions from uh, the council in prior meetings uh, that we'll address real quick. Uh, first, uh, we wanted to know how the 10% rate increase was determined. So first what we had to do was figure out what the tip fee was gonna be. So we aggregated all the costs related to transport and disposal of the waste. Uh, the tip fee then is offset by the elimination of the uh, disposal fee at Riverbend. Uh, we add the change to franchise fees and other administrative costs uh, to arrive at the total cost of the proposal. And then just like any other rate uh, making methodology, we figure the, re the uh, revenue requirement to cover that with the, uh, uh, to maintain our current operating ratio and the result is a 10% rate increase. Um, it was also asked uh, about Cowlitz County Landfill, uh, what the capacity was. Carl thought at that point that it was 100 years and it uh, turns out he was right. Uh, they do have 100 years of capacity and uh, McMinnville's tonnage will not significantly impact that number. Um, uh, it was also asked uh, how we selected Cowlitz County. So we, submit, we, uh, we asked for uh, several landfills to provide us with bids for rates. And in the end, once considering both transport and disposal costs, that was the best deal for McMinnville's trash. So if there are, uh, uh, again, uh, Recology really appreciates the opportunity to partner with the city to maintain the waste stream and manage the waste stream. If there's any other questions that council has now, we'd be happy to address those. So council, do you have um, any questions? No, I have Go one. ahead, Wendy. Did, uh, do you have any um, evaluation of how the landfill is run and certain criteria? Do you have any, um, did you have any evaluation of how the landfill is run and certain criteria that they have to meet with regards to that? Right, so according to the franchise agreement, we can only go to a licensed landfill, of course. Um, they are a licensed landfill. They're also a current uh, vendor. So all of our coast trash goes there now. So we have existing relationships with that landfill. We know that it's well run. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. In regard to your uh, financial statements that you presented some time back, there was a large administrative cost. Could you tell us what's comprised within that administrative cost? So uh, the... I'm sorry. Within the financial statements you presented not too long ago, there is a large financial... Oh. There is uh, Heard large. That's yeah, administrative costs. Could you explain what's within that administrative cost? So I think what you're referring to is the, the management and, and admin fee yeah. uh, that's part of the uh, uh, related party transactions. So those are all the, the people costs. Okay. So um, there's really three levels of that. We have local costs, regional costs, and corporate costs. Uh, the local costs are those people that we share among jurisdictions. So the people that uh, are in the call center, uh, our waste zero specialists. Um, Dave and I uh, are all part of, of that. Um, then we have a, a regional crew uh, that uh, specializes uh, in regional environmental, regional HR, um, uh, regional safety. Um, all of those people are also included in that number. And then of course there's the corporate side, uh, in, which includes finance, IT, um, uh, corporate HR, all of those kinds of, of costs. So it's the people costs associated with, with, all, of, with all of that. Kind of the overhead. Um, the, the people part of the overhead. The people right. part of the overhead, right. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I do have a question uh, brought up by a former mayor who was talking about uh, some agreements that had happened with uh, the land or with city sanitary. In the past, um, the city and the uh, and the agreement stated that the fulfillment, the formula was based on return on investment of, he thought, around 12%. There was to be no mingling of the various companies. So uh, fast forward, uh, City Sanitary became WOW, and from there, um, there was no audit performed. My question is, are we, how are we doing on return on investment? Is it around 12% or? So uh, according to the uh, documents that we submitted uh, for this, the our current projected uh, operating ratio, which is for all for practical purposes the the inverse of of the ROI number, is at 91.25. The uh, agreement calls for us to be uh, to maintain uh, a margin that would be between 85 and 91. So we projected that we would be outside that uh, range uh, this year because it was year two of the of the yard debris and glass rollout, and uh, so the the changes that are before you tonight would would as as indicated there would take us return us to that projected ninety one point two five. So we're outside the range uh, currently, and we're projecting to be. Uh, with the with Back the changes the and the and the uh, rate adjustment to go with it. Okay, thank you. I, I have one. Go ahead, there. Alan. Uh, just if you, if you could kind of hold your mic up, if yeah. we're having a hard time hearing you. The last time we met, uh, Mr. Peters mentioned that. Uh, how's that? Is that better? Uh, last time we met, uh, Mr. Peters said that we they were uh, Recology was with within weeks of having the transfer station operational. And what's the status of that transportation transfer station right now? We're awaiting final uh, approval or final inspection. Okay. So not quite there. Pretty close. Pretty close. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other comments, Kevin. Uh, one of the previous meetings that we had with with you guys here in the uh, before the council, uh, you talked about some of the other landfills that that res responded to your request at the time. Coffin Butte hadn't yet responded, and that's one landfill that's pretty close that I hear a lot about. Um, could you let us know whether they responded or if, how they kind of measured up against some other landfills? <clears throat> so I haven't heard anything from them recently um, in earlier bid conversations where we talked about rates uh, they were uh, similar to what we'd be paying now at Riverbend landfill and uh, the transport cost would be added on to that so they would have been uh, they would have been a more expensive option for us compared to uh, headquarters landfill there's also transport costs going the other direction and it is a few miles farther down the road, but once you're in a truck, the, the, the per mile uh, cost it, it doesn't change things that as much. So it's really a combination of those two that put them, um, I guess, not in first place so when it, it came the, to a bid. The, the tipping fees is kind of what set it over the edge. It was just cheaper to, to use the, the Cowlitz facility. It's, it wasn't a matter of transportation costs. It was, it was the disposal. Right. It was it was cheaper enough to offset the fact that it was uh, a longer drive. Right. Thank you. Other comments, Adam. Um, and your proposed rates and the examples that you've given, it centers mainly around our residential customers and our small businesses. Um, do you have any idea, or if the larger commercial and uh, industrial customers are going to see a 10% rate increase too. Is it 10% across the board? And your the letter that Carl put, he said he would uh, before implementation on January 1, he would provide a full um, rate sheet. But 
you guys didn't provide that in your proposal, so it kind of leaves it open-ended, and I'd like that addressed a little bit. Sure. On page three of the packet that uh, you received uh, at the end of October, it has uh, the, the first sections are the cart rates, or the most common cart rates. The second section are the container rates, and that third section, uh, the debris box example. All of, all of our trash haul fees for, so every time our truck arrives to take away that big box and bring it back empty. Um, those, that haul fee doesn't change by size. So uh, what does change for them is how much garbage happens to be in the box each time. And so the disposal charge uh, is the second line on there. And again, it'll, it'll vary by ton. The 10% would apply to the haul fees, which is that first line where we use the 20 yard box as the example. So the average uh, industrial uh, debris box user, whether it's uh, a uh, regular customer or a uh, one-off uh, job, uh, temporary box, that haul fee would be increased by $15.97 for each haul. The change in tip fee, again, would, would vary by how much is in the box. And our guess is that it would encourage folks to call us when the box is full because uh, you can save on the number of haul fees versus having us haul it twice when it's half full. Thank you. Kelly? I just have a couple more questions. Uh, you know, for many years, we used to have the lowest like rates in the area. Oh, sorry. Back again. For many years, we used to have the lowest rates in the area. Now, compared to Newburgh, who also has a transfer station, we're considerably higher. Is this due to some of the efforts we've gone through for recycling, or what are the reasons why our rates are higher now than a number of the uh, cities in the area? So, so yes, that is definitely a factor um, that we've elected to do that. Uh, uh, it's really difficult to do an apples to apples comparison, uh, city to city, because uh, the residential versus commercial versus, versus industrial makeup of different cities um, are different, and and uh, different companies uh, charge differently for for those uh, services. Um, if you want to. Sure. And Maybe a so, more for exa example. Sure. Um, so, for example, the the proposed rate that we'd be charging for a 32 gallon cart weekly service, um, out of the out of the information that we have from the Mid Valley Garbage and Recycling Association, is that uh, it's about half half and half split between are they lower than us or are they higher than us for that same service. So. Uh, we're, we would be at 24.55, and Beaverton, Gresham, Salem on the Marion, side, Marion County side, and, and uh, Silverton, Staten, Wilsonville, and Woodburn are all higher than than what we would propose McMinnville's would be for the same rate. As Walter said, different uh, different cities have different uh, composition of their, uh, especially their commercial rate base. Some cities have elected to. Um, subsidize residential or commercial, uh, depending on which was was struggling for them. So there, uh, there are different ways to do it. And also, obviously, if there are transfer stations involved or special programs like our yard debris drop off program, where if you're a customer, you can bring as much as you want as often as you want. That's very rare uh, around the state. So it's hard. It's really hard to stack it up exactly with uh, the services uh, from another town. Okay, thank you. Mayor, I have another question. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, I'd like to hear what the thought process was of of um, triple I up there, number uh, number two, I'm sorry. About the, it looks like it's just a blanket 10% on just about everything. And then no rate increases until June of 2019. And I'd just like to, hear what Recology's thought process was of arriving at that uh, blanket 10% and then not having a rate increase. Was there a, could you explain that? Uh, sure. So um, the, the, that was sort of the, the task at hand was to come up with a, a rate increase um, and, uh, and across the board rate increase for, for uh, transporting 
trash somewhere else. Um, and I think that it's logical to 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 put it um, have an across the board rate increase because everyone, uh, all all the different types of generators all have trash. So uh, I think that's why we came up with the ten percent. Um, and uh, and as I said, the the uh, the method of of arriving the math um, was pretty straightforward. It's just like any other projected uh, any other rating rate increase where we project the costs and then uh, have a revenue requirement to cover the costs. And uh, in regard to the timing, uh, we would normally come to the council once a year for a uh, rate review process. The way that we're approaching what we're all doing here tonight is basically taking what we would be here in June to talk about, moving that forward. So we didn't want to have customers concerned that they would, in six months, get another increase when this would be the, you know, the second one in, in a fairly short time. And one way to do that is say, we've moved everything up. We won't come to you again until the rate review process for 2019. Yeah, I would imagine you have some historical data to back up any kind of increase at that point, too. So, I mean, we're in a major transition, agreed. And uh, I'm just wondering if that's going to have a little bit more time for you to get the exact numbers, um, uh, give you a little bit more time to come up with data. Uh, and I think there's validity in that. I mean, it's going to take a little time to, for everything to shake out. You know, it's... Um, we're going to have to do some rerouting uh, to make sure that McMinnville's trash goes to the transfer station. We're not mixing trash from other cities. That's going to take a little time. We're going to, it's going to take a little time to get the operation running smoothly. And, and so, the, yeah, I think there will be some growing pains, and just like with any other new business. Um, so that being said, we, we do run a transfer station in Astoria already. So we have some experience, and we know what we're doing. So I don't think it will take you know, a long time. But uh, but but sure, I, I think that by the time we come back in in July of nineteen, we'll have we'll have good data for for what our costs are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions? Uh, go, Adam, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned other cities, which uh, I was curious of the total tonnage that Recology hauls to the Riverbend landfill. What does McMinnville's tonnage account for in a percent basis? It's, uh, it's about half. Thank you. Kevin? Um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this question. Uh, if the, River Bend has been uh, at risk of not, not expanding and their capacity has always kind of been in question if they're able to get the expansion. Uh, is there a benefit for us, I guess if you locked in a rate or a tipping fee with a Cowlitz County, um, so that if Riverbend were to close and everyone who's using it is now shopping around for another location, um, I mean, is there a benefit for us being so proactive in doing this now that would get us kind of in the front of the line as far as the supply and demand pressures on Cowlitz? Does that make any sense? Yes, I think in general, if you can get a good deal, it will be less of a good deal later when other people are are shopping as well. So this is, uh, I guess, the equivalent of Black Friday, maybe, or, <laughs> or Brown Thursday. Um, so it, we certainly want to move on the, the deal that we have before us. Um, there is some reasonable limit to how much material uh, Cowles County can take in at a time. Whether Their capacity is one thing, but how much waste they can process in a day and receive uh, into the So if if they take our tons, they may be saying no to to someone else or just not looking as hard uh, for someone else. And so we'd prefer to, to know uh, that we have a place to take the waste and not be caught out if uh, there is a run on regional landfill capacity. And, and it's something like closure of a major landfill and could with, cause that. With the with the tipping fee and all the other disposal charges at Cowlitz, have we have you were you able to get a contract uh, for more than one year, or what's how long is that that rate going to last with them? 
good question. Um, they're, they vary there. Often the contracts are, are 10 year contracts. Um, we're also exploring the possibility of not pursuing a long term deal so that we'd have or have options to, uh, to opt out of the remainder of the deal if a, another landfill uh, comes up with a with better price, we obviously we have an interest in, in getting uh, the folks in, in McMinnville or, or Astoria the, the best rate that we can uh, for for their waste disposal. So the current rate we have now is for how long? With under your proposal, sure. I, I believe we had a the the quote or, or the bid that we received had a had a 90 day window on it. So at some point, if we go back to them and say, hey, remember that. That deal you offered us back in September, and it's and we haven't talked to them in between time. They may say, "Well, times have changed." But I believe it's a 90-day clock on on the bid that we're holding. I'm now. locking in on that rate, but once we've locked in, how long will it last? I mean, could they come back in nine in, uh, in a year saying we're going to up the rate, or are you going to be guaranteed a rate for a period of time? That will depend on the, on the details of, of the agreement. We we can't. We can't get to that state, that level of detail yet, until we can promise them that we're that we're really coming. I, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? I got one more. Um, so, our city tonnage generates a dollar sixty per ton for the county as far as revenue goes. What is our overall tonnage that we send annually to the landfill? Just the city of McMinnville. Yeah. Yeah, it's somewhere between 19,500 and 20,000 tons. Okay. Thank you. Wendy? Um, we had uh, I have a follow-up question for Kevin, uh, to qu Kevin's question. I guess it's, I'm closest to the thing, so uh, go ahead, Councilor Dredkin. Okay. Uh, so you said that that would, the, the information that Kevin asked, how long would we be able to confirm this rate? You said that you really wouldn't be able to tell us that until you're further along in the negotiations. Um, so can you kind of play that out a little further for all of us? Um, uh, you know, if, if, if we were to move forward um, and then they're only going to, you know, give you this rate for a year or three years. What's kind of an industry standard? Um, can you just can you just talk that point out a little further, please? Um, sure. This this is Dave Larmouth uh, again, and a typical term agreement would be ten years with uh, adjustments uh, tied to a, a regional CPI index or or something similar. Um, there are probably loop, loopholes uh, that would allow them to change the rate uh, higher than that if there was a, uh, a change in law or a significant change in their circumstances. And then in, in you know, the, the part of the agreement that, that we'd be writing would say, yes, but if you do that, we get to leave whenever we want. So they have an interest in, in, in keeping our tons and so those sort of out of out of agreement uh, adjustments are, are rare. Uh, at least they have been historically. And I think that's that's an important note as well. That, that a company like Callitz County Landfill has uh, the, they want to keep the tons as well. So it's it's unlikely I think that they would they price us out of their own market. Thank you, Remy. Uh, Thank Wendy. You. Uh, we had a question from uh, one of our citizens in our previous meeting um, about the number five in the financial documents from June. There's an amount of $4 million for related party transactions. Could you address that and clarify what that is? Sure. So uh, we, we've already talked about it a little bit. Um, about $1 million of those, of that $4 million is the management admin fees uh, that we've already talked about. Uh, other pieces of the related party transactions are um, things like health care and workers' compensation insurance, vehicle insurance, these things that uh, when we uh, get all of the recology subsidiaries together and buy one plan, we get a cheaper plan. Um, 
uh, the truck purchasing is the same way. So when you if we buy one truck, it's one cost. If you buy 30 trucks, it's a different cost. Um, so we're able to take advantage of, of those uh, types of savings. Um, and then they become intercompany charges uh, at that point. Uh, we also, some of our disposal, our yard debris disposal is an intercompany charge. Um, I think that's most of them. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? To my right, to my left. Remy, any other questions? No, thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate your coming with uh, detailed information for us. And uh, uh, we will now move into our public hearing. And again, uh, let me just share. Uh, I will call you by name, and you can come up and speak very closely into the microphone. There will be a three-minute limit for the number that uh, we have that are going to be speaking this evening. An alarm will go off, and we'll, uh, we'll cut you off, and, uh, and uh, we'll just go from that perspective. Any further? Nothing at this time, but we'll, we will be here if, if things come up in, that you'd like Thank us you. to address. Just Thank let you, us know. gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last time I, uh, we, we tried to do this. Uh, okay, our first, uh, we've got Mark Davis. Mark, if you'd uh, come up first. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I hope this hearing doesn't turn into some sort of uh, referendum on the landfill. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience and I'd like to talk about rates. Um, I believe the city made a de facto decision to part ways with the landfill a couple of years ago um, when you started to move into urban renewal and investing money in Visit McMinnville. Um, you know, millions of dollars in public and private investment have already been made. And I don't believe that uh, this focus on tourism is helped by having a large pile of garbage sitting on the edge of town that occasionally wafts odor into the community. We can't have it both ways. And I think it's hypocritical to think that we should be dumping our garbage at, at Riverbend while we also want to take the position that it shouldn't be there. We should, we should support the rate adjustment to facilitate that change that, that Recology has proposed. That said, I do not support this rate increase proposal because I believe it is incomplete. While I appreciate the efforts that both Councillor Stassens and Councillor Minky made to answer the, the request for information that I made at the last meeting, I don't believe there was any actual financial information provided so that anyone could look at it. I could quote you again from the, the uh, franchise agreement but I only have three minutes here and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the issues that I raised. I really think that the council needs to have written financial information that the citizens can look at. <clears throat> um, and I want to repeat, I'm not trying to attack Recology. I support what they're trying to do. I think they're doing a great job in the community. I just believe that they are a monopoly. We've granted them this franchise. No one else can deliver garbage service in this community, and we need to hold them accountable and ask them to provide us financial information so we can look at it and make sure that everything's on the up and up. I attend other hearings in this community on utility issues, sewer, water, and electricity. And in every one of those cases, there's complete financial information. In fact, typically there's a consultant that the, the city or McMinnville Water and Light hires to provide expert you know, opinions and to make sure everything's fair and above board. Um, I noticed that in this uh, the proposal before you that the city will be receiving $360,000 in franchise fees. I would suggest that maybe that the city in the next budget ought to look at putting some of that money towards hiring someone to provide some expertise in reviewing these financial statements before we approve these kind of hearings. <clears throat> in conclusion, you know, 
I hope you will listen to the public this evening, hear what everybody has to say, and then, and then postpone a decision until you've had a chance to get the full information that was requested at the last meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We next will be hearing from Ramsey McPhillips. Ramsey, please come up. Hello, it's Ramsey McPhillips. Um, so last time, um, apparently I was a little rough on you according to the paper. Um, so I want to assure you that I'm um, perhaps litigious, but for good reasons, but that I don't plan to sue the council, simply reiterate why there is a pending lawsuit um, related to any further waste going into the landfill because it harms me. The lawsuit at the Supreme Court and the ensuing lawsuit here in the county is about farmland. It's my farm and the actual standing of the harm is mine. So when I speak of these things, maybe I'm not quite so um, uh, off the cuff as, as Jeb suggested in the paper. And I certainly, um, he suggested, Wendy, that you might especially be offended by my testimony and I, I hope that's not the case. So. Um, to follow Mark's lead, I would like to just point out a few um, rate facts. As you know, the landfill had to do, or the county had to do a very extensive research on what would happen if Riverbend landfill didn't go away when they made their decision to expand it. And they hired a $42,000 um, firm to do a projection of just what would happen. So here we are. Those projections can be matched to real time estimates that are being provided to you by Recology. So, a couple of years ago, when the county said that there was a need for Riverbend landfill, they said that a transfer station would cost $6.2 million. This transfer station in real time is perhaps 1.5 at the most two. They said that we would be driving all over up the gorge, maybe to Coffin Butte, and that the, the least amount of increase based on the cost per capita of the cost of the transfer station and the transportation costs and the interruption would be somewhere between 25%. And if you accepted the letters that they sent out during a campaign, 250%. So um, I just really want to point out that when you make this decision, it's um, not based on these reports that were scaring the community. They're based on what Recology is actually offering you. And, and I'm hoping that you understand that that means that the landfill is not really necessary. It's kind of obsolete based on what the county had previously analyzed. If they no longer have the tipping fees because Portland went away and the costs aren't that much, 10%, and I've got them in court and doing pretty well, and there's a horrible expected earthquake which is going to greatly affect the landfill upriver, I don't see a reason realistically for you to send the garbage there. So um, I hope you don't. Do you have any questions? Thanks. Thank, thank you. We next have D. Goldman. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a Recology customer here in McMinnville, and I just wanted to express that I'm really pleased that we had this opportunity to send our garbage to a more environmentally stable site and to not add to the stench of the landfill and to the impact on local farmers. And uh, the people I've talked to, as well as myself, having heard the estimates from waste management, 10% uh, sounds very reasonable. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Jeff Flowey. Flowery? Flahey? Jeff? Flahey. 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 Yeah. I'll get it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for this having, thank you for having this, uh, this session here. Uh, in my estimation, 
Riverbend isn't dead, and the courts could rule in favor of continuing it. And if Riverbend prevails and we bail, Riverbend is going to either extend their lifetime by the amount of garbage that we don't send them, or they'll find a new customer. So in that sense, it seems like this is a little premature. If you ignore what I just said, I support the recology effort, and I would invite you to approve the, the proposal. That would be, that would put you in the shoes of leading the charge in the local area for, for getting out of the waste management business, getting, getting waste management out of business. And the impact to Yamhill County would be somewhere between 800000 and a million dollars a year. <clears throat> That's the for the, the tipping fees that they're collecting, which would force the commissioners to do something. And I know you don't have any say on what the, well, you have a minimal amount of, uh, uh, of influence over the county commissioners, but it would be the second, second uh, cost to the, apparent cost to the customers garbage customers that you started. I'm very thankful that you are there and I'm not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> we next have uh, Terry, uh, Terry Peasley. Terry? And Terry, could you state your full name in the microphone before you start? Uh, Terry A. Peasley. I live here in McMinnville, 1051 Southeast Shady Street. Okay. Uh, this is the very first time I ever sit before people such as you, and I feel this is a great pleasure. I really don't have too much more to add than what has already been said, so I want to leave it at that, I guess. Uh, I do agree with uh, the opportunity to spend a little bit more on rates to... Um, so I don't contribute more to the local landfill, which I feel, feel is way overdue to be uh, shut down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. Jason Lett. And Jason, if you can uh, introduce yourself just by name over the mic. Hi, Jason Lett. I'm here representing my business, the Ivory Vineyards. Uh, we just processed our 48th harvest here within the McMinnville city limits this year. And uh, with the comings of the rain, I've started to notice something that seems to happen every year, which is even uh, at our place, which is on 10th Street, we can smell the landfill. And uh, after watching all the incredible changes that have happened on Alpine Avenue over the last few months, I just want to reiterate um, the praise that Mr. Davis gave uh, to what the city is doing for urban renewal but also, um, like him, uh, point out that it's a little bit inconsistent with continuing to grow the landfill and anything that the city can do to move that uh, problem to a more environmentally sensitive area, or less environmentally sensitive area, rather, uh, is great. And as a business owner and as a resident of the city, I would fully support a 10% rate increase in order to see that happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. I have next Sam Bear. And Sam, if you could state your name for the record. <clears throat> Sam Bear, a uh, little background on myself. I worked for waste management for about 10 years. And during that time, I worked at a waste to energy plant. Um, right now, we are not disposing of our trash. We're relocating it, landfills. They start off gassing immediately, methane, carbon dioxide. At, they try to put in methane capture at landfills, but at best, methane capture is only 50% effective. 
So this gas is still going into the atmosphere where it's a very potent um, greenhouse gas. Um, instead of putting our trash in landfills, we could talk to Covanta Brooks, um, where there's a waste energy plant in Brooks, Oregon. Um, right now, they take in all of Marion County's trash. Um, they incinerate approximately 550 tons per day and generate 13 megawatts that goes out to the electric grid. Um, it would be possible, right now they have, they're maxed out, but they have room to add another boiler. They could take in another 275 or more tons per day. Uh, McMinnville could get into discussions with them either unilaterally or with the other municipalities in the county and see about possibly increasing there or if you wanted more control, um, see about building a waste energy plant in the county. Uh, that way we don't have to trash or uh, I'm sorry, we don't have to haul our trash over 100 miles to a landfill where future generations are going to have to take care of it. Right now, we're talking about rate increases of about 10%. There is a cost in the waste energy, but I think the people of McMinnville and Yamhill County would be willing to bear that cost to do the right thing now instead of kicking our problems down the road to future generations. Any questions? Any questions for Sam? Thank you, Sam. Uh, Jerry Hunter. Jerry, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Jerry Hunter, for the record. Right, I get to do that. Good evening, and thank you for hearing all of us. Um, I come to you this evening in several roles, a uh, city resident, downtown business owner, and as a board member of Zero Waste McMinnville. I can say on all three counts, I'm strongly in favor of the city redirecting the city's solid waste away from River Bend landfill. As a paying customer of Recology, I'm quite happy to pay the proposed rate increase in order to see that happen. I see decisions such as this, the cost-benefit analysis, and the only possible benefit of continuing to send McMinnville solid waste to Riverbend Landfill is a short-term small rate savings for Recology's customers. The cost of doing so include perpetuating and even increasing the visual blight on our beautiful landscape, the significant offensive odors coming from the landfill and contamination of our watershed, both ongoing and the potentially cataclysmic impact of the landfill breaching or even subsiding into the river in the event of a significant seismic impact. Um, I know waste management has said otherwise, but I'm as yet unconvinced that a mountain of garbage sitting on top of saturated soil next to a river can be made stable in the event of a major earthquake. The cost of diverting the city's waste away from River Bend are minimal, and the benefits of doing so could be significant. In my assessment, there's no benefit to our community of sending waste to the River Bend landfill, and in fact, doing so, as some others have said this evening, runs counter not only to the health, well-being, and enjoyment of our citizens, but also counter to the many efforts made by our community to promote businesses in our area. Increasingly, McMinnville is promoting itself as a tourist destination, in addition to the efforts of many individual businesses and the tremendous investment being made in the Atticus Hotel project, including by the city. Um, the excellent work being done by Visit McMinnville, funded by the city's transient lodging tax, comes to mind in promoting our city as a destination. Why would we as a community contribute to an actual stinking pile of garbage adjacent to the farms and wineries, as well as our downtown and largest waterway? I doubt you'll find any businesses would, as part of their business model, put a pile of garbage anywhere near their customers. Why would we do this as a community? Let us not contribute to or depend upon its continued operation. As a taxpayer, I also strongly question the prudence, wisdom, and fiduciary responsibility of the city entering into a contract that would have our waste taken to River Bend. Uh, Councillor Jeffries spoke to this a little bit, but given the many uncertainties and legal battles surrounding its continued operation, it seems very much not in the taxpayer's interest to spend the city's finite resources, time, and money to negotiate and enter into a contractual agreement for services that includes such an uncertain cost element. Come to think of it, I'd direct the same a council to <coughs> Recology. I know in my businesses, I would not bind myself to a vendor whose supply chain was as clearly fraught with legal and operational uncertainty as River Bend Landfill appears to be. Potential benefits to the city are many. This franchise agreement is an opportunity to put contractually into place any number of good things and to fund them in the process. 
One of the most exciting possibilities is the creation of a dedicated zero waste position at Recology. We've heard from Carl Peters that such a position is a goal of Recology's. We have in front of us an opportunity to get that in writing, to fund it, and to make it real. Looking back a few years, Carl's predecessor, Fred Stemmler, ex expressed a similar intent to bring glass recycling to McMinnville. As I understand it, that intent was made real when it was put into the current franchise agreement. Let's move it forward again. Possibilities for recycling in infrastructure and services at the new transfer station, which could be funded with tipping fees that the city currently chooses not to collect, as I understand. Thank you, Jerry. We've run out of time. Thank you. Uh -huh. Ilsa Purse. And again, you signed for an agenda item, but you're talking about the rating fees. I this agenda item. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Ilsa Purse. Um, before I talk about garbage, my favorite topic, I would really like to make a comment that for a beautiful, high-tech, brand-new room like this, there is something wrong with the audio system so that no one in the audience can hear any of you, ever. This is, I mean, I know my hearing isn't as good as it used to be, but it's really a struggle in here. Perhaps someone in the city could work on your system because... We've already been discussing it tonight. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to commend all of you on the thoroughness of your uh, questioning of what's at, what's at stake. Uh, the diligence with which you are looking at what Recology wants to do is very, very good. And I would like to say I only wish the county had looked at waste management quite as carefully as you're looking at Recology. Uh, I also think that this is time for you to realize that McMinnville is being put on the map partly because of your plastic bag ban. Um, I had out-of-town guests recently. They come from Boston. When they realized they couldn't put things, there, there were no plastic bags in the local stores, they were really impressed. So keep it up. You're doing a great job. I am a part owner in a downtown business, and I just would like to say that a 10% increase in our garbage rates will mean virtually nothing. And this is a very small business. There's not a lot of money in an art gallery but we can easily afford 10% to make it so this town of McMinnville is not participating in the um, environmental disaster that is Riverbend Landfill. And just uh, uh, to give you some anecdotal stories, the last few days the landfill has smelled, according to many people who've been in the area, worse than ever. So everything waste management has said they can do to ameliorate the odor is really smoke and mirrors. It will only get worse. And I would really commend you for not participating in the destruction of the air quality in this county. Thank you so much. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Elsa. Thanks. Uh, Jim. Keith Spender, and Jim will have to pronounce his name, see how close I came. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jim Kreutzbender, okay. 1317 Northeast 9th Avenue in McMinnville. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, yes, it's time for McMinnville to keep moving forward. You, you did the plastic bag ban and that's been great and so it's time to pull the plug on participating in an environmental disaster like Ilsa just said at some point you have to take a stand and move away from those um, operations that are going to not benefit the city or the local area and so yes the rates may go up a little bit but um, for most people, I don't think that will be much more than a couple cup, cups of coffee per month, you know. And the last time we had a major hearing here, you know, several businesses came here and they threw up their hands and they were going to go out of business because the rates were going to go up astronomically, of course, like uh, Riverbend said they were. And um, so I'm sure rates have gone up since then. 
and probably those businesses are still in business. And the rates in other cities are higher and I don't see the news that businesses are going out of business just because rates have gone up five or 10%. So I think the people of McMinnville will manage with a 10% um, and it'll be hard on some people, on the poor people. Um, they will have to uh, downscale their garbage service. Uh, I think uh, maybe Recology can educate people a little more about downscaling their services if they need uh, to reduce their costs. And so um, I think it's, it's good that the city is pulling out of this uh, operation with Riverbend. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any questions for Jim? Thank you. Uh, Sid Freeman. And Sid, you put down an agenda item, but you're talking about the rate increase. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, so for, for the record, my name is Sid Friedman. I live in an unincorporated part of the county, so your vote here doesn't affect me directly, at least not immediately. But I wish like hell that it did, because it really pains me that my garbage is dumped in a leaking landfill just upstream from McMinnville, on a riverbank, no less. I've, I've heard some say that it's foolish for McMinnville to divert its trash from Riverbend because others will continue to dump there. But to me, that's like saying we shouldn't do anything about global warming because China's gonna continue to burn coal. This isn't about what others do. This is about the choices that we make and what we do. And I would gladly pay 10% more to have my garbage not go to Riverbend if I had that choice. So with that, I urge you to uh, vote yes and approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Any questions for Sid? Thank you. Annalie Germain. And you had on an agenda item, but you're talking about rate increases. Mr. Mayor, I will get to that point in just a little bit. Well, why don't we keep, why don't we, we, we you should have come up with the other thing during our comment period, because uh, this is a public hearing that we're talking about those, f those three items. So if you can keep your comments to those three items, we'd appreciate it. It directly relates. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor and council members, I'm here to talk with you about, well, the rate increase, but styrofoam as well. Styrofoam takes up huge amounts of landfills. We can do a little bit of math here. Filling material, packing material is probably 30% of any given landfill. Of the packing material, probably a third of that is styrofoam. So we have 10% of any given landfill could be styrofoam according to current estimates. So now styrofoam takes up a lot of room. And when you think about the collection system, the people at Recology who have to go out and fetch the dumpsters with the styrofoam in it, that costs the same to the consumer and costs the same to the hauler. It's the same. When it reaches the transfer point, we have an opportunity to intervene and pick the styrofoam out of the system. So we are reducing things that go to the landfill by possibly 10%. Now, um, the only thing that's holding up us doing this big step is that Recology must make a commitment to provide a collection point at their facility. When talking with Mr. Peters about this, he has said to Zero Waste members that that project will be considered among others. So ergo, we have no start point, we have no commitment from Recology to take that big chunk of trash out of the stream. 
If we have 10% less going to the landfill, that means a 10% savings in trucking and hauling and um, emissions in wear and tear on the roads in staff time. If we have a 10% savings there, we might not need a rate increase. That's all. Thank you, Emily. Any questions? I will call one last time. Any other comments for our public hearing? Thank you. I will go ahead and close our. Come up and identify yourself and put your name and your give us your name and your address. Um, Annette Madrid, P.O. Box 683 Carlton. Um, I'm just thrilled that I hope you're going to do this. Um, about 30 years ago, Cleo Westfall uh, introduced me to a lot of items garbage related. Uh, Citizens Against Pollution. It was a couple little old ladies wearing pink caps and uh, living out in Carleton and getting a lot of the bypass traffic through our town um, taught me a lot. So gladly, and hopefully Carleton will start working on that, will follow suit. Gladly would I pay 10% or more. And I really, really hope that you follow through and do this because McMinnville is on the map for some of the right reasons, some of the wrong reasons but to absolutely not contribute to the problem is thrilling. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will go ahead and close our public hearing. Um, counselors, at this time, we can have a discussion or we can wait uh, as we get into the resolutions and the ordinances that would be appropriate for the discussions. How would you like to proceed? Coming up later on in the agenda. We have done so. Uh, Jeff uh, dutifully went out and got you back up front here, oh, Remy. Thank you. So, uh, you think just in, in, in top with by topic as we go through the way? Okay, good, because we've got a couple of presentations that um, we've got individuals waiting. Okay. We have two presentations this evening. The first is going to be our annual report from our Landscape Review Committee, and we'll call on our Associate Planner, uh, Chuck Darnell, to present. Chuck? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Uh, so I'm Chuck Darnell, I'm the Associate Planner here, and I staff the Landscape Review Committee. So this is our annual report to you on their um, recent activities and uh, work to be done in the coming year. Um, so the LRC roles basically are to review and approve all landscape plans in the city uh, for new construction and redevelopment projects. Um, they specifically, they look at landscape plans, uh, street tree plans, which are for subdivisions, um, and street tree removal requests. Um, and the group gets into pretty, um, pretty detailed uh, in their review. They'll look at specific species and location of everything. Um, and they consider the long-term aesthetics of the site. So I just put a photo up here of kind of how things change over time. And the committee really looks at um, things even before the buildings are in place and thinks about how the landscape will look in the future. So uh, they're uh, a, a group of five people. There's cur currently five members. Um, we have a couple of landscape architects, a landscape contractor, uh, a member of the McMinnville Garden Club, and um, the other member is the founder of Trees for McMinnville. So a diverse uh, knowledge base on the, on the group, and they're they're very good in their um, in their review. Um, so in 2017, we we established a monthly meeting. So we meet now on the third Wednesday of the month at noon. Uh, it's a public meeting open to anyone. 
Um, one of their bigger projects in the past year was updating the landscaping and tree chapters of the zoning ordinance, which came before you for ordinance amendments. Um, and during the course of the year, they also reviewed 38 land use applications. Um, so some of the types of applications to look at, like I said, the big ones are landscape plans. So these are for new construction in town. And I picked out a few recent ones just as examples of, of buildings you might see going up around town. Um, so this is the new office retail building out there just south of 2nd uh, Street on Hill Road. Uh, so this is a landscape plan for that. Um, a new multifamily building on Baker Street, north of Highway 99. Uh, this is a 16 unit facility and actually the landscape plan includes, you know, a nice area in the back, an open space area, and they were able to do shade trees around the whole thing for screening. So they look at things like that and how, how a site can be designed with landscaping to fit in well with the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, this is an example of an industrial building um, out in the industrial park. Uh, again, screening around the building from adjacent properties, uh, the uh, installation of street trees in the right of way, uh, that's something that often comes up on new construction. Um, and so just a number of other plans, they look at um, remodel projects. This is the, the uh, school district's uh, maintenance facility on Lafayette Avenue. Um, we have a larger scale commercial building going in um, right next to Lowe's that they recently approved. Um, and another new construction, the McMinnville gas reconstruction. So these are all projects that are going on in town that you might see um, and just know that the Landscape Review Committee has been looking at these in detail and all those plans have gone through that board for uh, review and approval. Uh, and this is another example of a street tree plan. So this is for any subdivision. Um, Alan's probably familiar with this one, but this is the bungalows. So they'll look at street tree plans too and they look at spacing and species type and uh, in the street tree plan review. Um, so in 2018, just something to watch for. Um, obviously, they'll be continuing their land use application review. Um, they're going to look at a little bit more into the, the street tree removal process. Um, we have a, we've had a number of those this past year. Um, and also, we're going to get some input from them and potentially look at bringing in some expert opinion on um, street trees and the maintenance of downtown trees in particular. Uh, those are a little bit unique as the city is responsible for maintaining those. Um, so that's basically the update I had. Um, our chair wasn't able to make it tonight, but um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the committee. Thank you, Chuck. Any questions from the councilor and Remy? No, none from me, thank you. Okay, Adam? I'd just like to say that um, the work you guys do is very important and it affects the city for many years to come. And I like what you guys have been doing over the past decade and you can really see what's going on. Thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. In my neighbor in particular, on the on the west side by Hill and Second, there's several trees that are uplifting sidewalks, and and it seems like the the, the tree selection was was a huge error. They're very encroaching. They they break sprinkler lines. They crack the sidewalks. Um, they're choking out lawns. Um, are we? Are we learning from those lessons and not picking those trees in the future? And are we giving any relief to those families that are suffering with these trees that were mandated to be put in there that are destroying their property? Um, we have learned, I think, from our past experience. Um, just, I think, two years ago, we adopted new planting standards that hopefully seek to address those types of things. Um, so we have new planting standards that require root barrier protection to prevent uh, shallow root systems and push things away from surrounding infrastructure. Um, there are going to be issues with trees and urban areas in general, but we, we are hoping to mitigate those types of things in the future. And species selection is another thing that the committee looks at, um, and we're hoping to do a lot better with our inspection process too and making sure trees are planted properly too. Um, so it's kind of a broad approach to it, but yeah, we, we are thinking about those kinds of things. Thanks. Councillor Jeffries, can I follow up as well? Um, so Heather Richards, planning director. Um, one, one of the other things we're doing with the Landscape Review Committee, and, and Chuck, um, Chuck identified this in his presentation, but to elaborate a little bit further, uh, we, so we don't have a certified arborist on staff. 
Um, so we're reaching out to a, another vendor that not only has certified arborists, but the next step up of what a certified arborist is. I can't recall what that is, but we're going to work with them and get some consultation on what would be best practices that perhaps they're going to review our code, look at our standards for planting in our code and, and give us some advice and consultation on are there places where we can make tweaks in the code in terms of best practices so that we can ensure that street trees are being planted and can be retained and be healthy and be an asset to the neighborhood and the properties around it. So we're working through that process right now in that discussion. Thank you. Wendy? Um, I just had a question about what are some typical things that the Landscape Review Committee, when they get a plan, will generally address and might have to request as put into the plan? Are there some standard things that generally come up that they wind up contributing to, the, to make changes in plans that they receive? Yeah, I think the um, most typical things are just um, scale of the landscaping with the project. So if you have a large building going in, they'll look at species that'll you know, be uh, commensurate with that. Um, they'll look at screening of properties and uh, parking areas and making sure proper types of trees are in um, parking areas that don't drop a lot of tree litter. And so they look at details like that. And if they have concerns with anything, oftentimes they'll... Um, continue an application, share their concerns with an applicant, and allow them to make adjustments based on those concerns and come back to a future meeting. Um, so that's kind of the process that they go through. And those are some of the things that they look at in detail. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Pascal? Uh, yes, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I just want to be a cheerleader for your committee. Uh, the mayor actually talked me into going to my first landscape review committee and uh, meeting and I've been attending since then. It's a great way to find out what's happening in McMinnville and I'm learning a lot about plants so it's uh, a very lively group and I've enjoyed it very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Kelly. And I'd just like to recognize Chuck and his leadership. Um, our last um, council meeting we had an opportunity to have the annual uh, report from our historic uh, Preservation Committee and this, the Landscape Review Committee, under your direction, has really picked up, I think, a lot of consistency and steam. And as Kelly indicated, I, uh, I've i made most of the meetings this year. Yeah. And I, I find it very, uh, the in-depthness and the skill and the abilities of those that are on our committee. I would think any community would, would would dive for the kind of expertise that we have on our committee. It is not a rubber stamp process. I, many, many things have been returned to the developer and come back at our next meeting and we have a much better plan. And so again, thank you for the report, Chuck, and tell the committee members how much we appreciate their efforts because uh, this is a kind of unsung committee that consistently is doing good work. Yeah, thank you, yeah. And I'll pass that along to the committee members as well. Thank you. Thanks. Next, we have another presentation. Uh, we have our downtown safety t uh, task force update, and I'll call on Chief Matt Skills and our recreation director, Susan Muir, to come up and give us our first report of this task force and uh, welcome the two of them. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, this is like uh, you had mentioned, this is our first, I believe, of three updates of the downtown safety task force. This task force was uh, put together after testimony was taken uh, at council sessions um, in July the 25th and, and also July the, the 11th. And I think as you recall, um, the charge of this task force based on the resolution uh, is to um, collect data, interview those uh, that are affected by uh, uh, negative behaviors in the downtown core, core area. Uh, let me first, uh, before we get into the what we've been up to, is uh, recognize the task force members. Um, uh, Celia McClellan, uh, I believe she's here. She is. Okay. Celia, uh, raise your hand. There we go. Uh, Jeff Sargent with the White Cap. Jeff. Uh, I know Eric is here too, Marksbury with First Baptist. Thank you. Uh, Rick Widener, also known as McMinnville Cool, is here. Um, 
Uh, Bethany Ball with uh, uh, Yamhill County Mental Health, uh, Health and Human Services. Lucetta Elmer, uh, I don't believe she's here. Uh, she's a business owner uh, downtown, owns a couple of businesses, as well as Kelly Jacobs. He's a community member. I don't believe he's here. Uh, we also have uh, Counselor Garvin as our liaison, and our alternative uh, or alternate liaison would be Counselor Menke. Uh, and then uh, Natalie Levine, our assistant city attorney, is there for legal uh, advice as we uh, probably delve into some topics uh, later on in our uh, in our meetings uh, that are going to be critical uh, as if ordinances are in fact moved forward so uh, let's get into um, what we're what we're doing here uh, the first two meetings uh, which are public uh, and are posted online and hopefully tonight we can get a, a peek into what um... I don't know why there we go. no sorry Oh, click. Right arrow. Yeah. We're all sorts of. Let's get the timings on. No. We are into a resolution now. Any end? Let's see. Guess that. I can't get that to go. There we go. Okay, perfect. Uh, the, uh, during the first two meetings, which I mentioned, are open to the public uh, and are noticed online uh, and through the website. Uh, we took uh, uh, the first two meetings, especially the first one, we're really uh, delving into uh, history uh, of, of specifically the two council meetings. And, and Susan did a tremendous job of, of diving into those two public testimonies. And I would bet she probably lot, uh, was in her office for about four or five hours at least, uh, listening and collating and categorizing the behaviors that had come up uh, during that, that testimony. Um, uh, we also have reviewed existing laws and ordinances that are on the books right now. Uh, those laws and ordinances are things that we can do to help affect uh, or, or change behavior. Uh, so the, the, the task force has taken a look at those. Um, in addition, we've also uh, reviewed existing data. So uh, the police department was able to pull uh, data for the last year uh, from September 17, I believe, to, back to September 16, and, and really take a look at all the calls for service that we do have downtown, uh, whether they were, and they were categorized by our, our economic improvement district, uh, that general area. And it, and it does show that we are downtown, the police is downtown and are doing um, things, but we're also responding to calls. And the types of calls, uh, as you'll see, if you go to that uh, website down below, we'll categorize exactly what we're responding to. Um, we uh, have since um, uh, categorized these behaviors. I want to tell you exactly, obviously, the overarching theme within the, the, the downtown safety task force the, is the critical thing is we're dealing with safety issues. Um, and under that umbrella of safety concerns, uh, the, uh, the issues that have been identified uh, through the public testimony, and I think they'll probably come out even more when we get to the online survey results, is um, we, we are dealing with uh, harassment, aggressive panhandling, uh, smoking, drug and alcohol use, loitering, garbage, trash, needles, and then also, unfortunately, human waste. So those have been the identified categories of behavior that are negative that we want initially to take a look at. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we're in the process. In fact, today, uh, an online survey has gone out through the McMinnville Downtown Association. We're also working with the Sodan neighborhood and Ellie Gunn to provide uh, that information, that survey out to that portion of the neighborhood, uh, which would be south of uh, 3rd Street, essentially. And then also uh, the police department uh, and volunteers uh, this coming week will be going uh, door to door uh, in that northern portion of that corridor, 4th to 5th, Adams probably up to Irvine and Johnson is hanging door hangers, uh, letting people know that this survey is online uh, and that we're encouraging them to take it and, and provide input for our task force. Um, am I missing anything? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as we gather this information, this information is going to be online. Uh, I believe the survey is open until the 19th. Uh, and once that survey, which is already coming in, uh, we've got, I think, close to 90 uh, returns already. Um, we're going to collate that, that information and then uh, start brainstorming potential solutions uh, and tools that can be implemented uh, if there is some negative behaviors that uh, the task force decides this is something that we want to tackle. 
Okay. Um, uh, and I, I would wish I wish we could open up that 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 uh, the website, but I don't believe it is. Or if it is, that'd be great. Um, one of the overriding themes, and it's not going to show up here, but one of the overriding themes is uh, within that public testimony is was a lack of communication or a communication we weren't messaging what exactly the city's doing or what's going on in the downtown area. Chuck is awesome. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yep. Uh, he is also an IT guru. Uh, with Scott Burke's uh, team's assistance, uh, as I had mentioned a little bit earlier, communication, there was a communication gap about what's exactly going on downtown, uh, what the police department's doing, and then also uh, providing the public information about what exactly task force is doing, uh, where we're headed, and that sort of. So this is essentially our messaging uh, theme or our website. Uh, as you can see, it's got agendas, meeting notes, uh, background information. Uh, that's information that we've provided about different criminal scenarios that might take place downtown uh, and what possible crimes could be committed or have been committed. Uh, we've also got uh, ongoing police department directed patrols. And if you scroll down there a little bit, Susan, uh, what we're doing is weekly adding updates. We've directed our, as, as we had mentioned, I think to the city manager, we've directed an officer to be down there a minimum of hours uh, uh, as, as long as uh, time is available to be down there and be present and, and make contacts with the community members and the business owners as well as residents. So these are essentially just history, history, historical take look backs about a week about what's going on in the core area. We also included the downtown parking structure, that sort of thing. So this is what you're looking at right now. And uh, it, it candidly, it's been quiet with the weather. There's not been a lot of issues. And I'd like to say either it's weather inclusive included uh, is helping the issue, but it's also, I think, the fact that we've got a presence downtown now. But anyway, this this website is messaging exactly what we're doing, what's going on downstairs, and giving people some real facts. I'd also like to point out that uh, Susan did uh, some research, and uh, she's hopefully dispelled a uh, long-held uh, urban legend that Portland was shipping almost people by the dozens to our city. Uh, there's a news story online uh, that she's uh, added to the website that is um, really really dispels that myth that, in fact, they're in the entire city of Portland, I believe there was a, a, a total of a dozen uh, tickets or vouchers that were sent to uh, uh, these uh, homeless people that were actually had homes to go to. So it wasn't they weren't just shipping them to, to cities with no place to go. They were shipping, they were providing them transportation to a home uh, where people were ready and willing to take them back into their home. So uh, that's the website. And unfortunately, I don't know if we're going to be able to get back to the slideshow. But where we're going from here is. Yep. Oh, you did? I don't know where it is. It's in this one. Matt, while you're getting there, I just wanted to share. I've been following that your new web page yep. and especially those police reports and it really gives you a historical nature of kind of where we started and what's what's happening and i think for citizens that are really um wanting to know kind of up to date what's happening on the beat i i i I applaud what what's happening uh, from a reporting and the transparency that you're you're having with the citizens. I think that's important. Uh, getting that information out uh, as close to real time as possible. So uh, our next steps. I don't know if you want to go into this, Susan. Sure. sure. So we have five more meetings before the final check in that we have with you, which will happen in March. So the committee will meet five more times. We plan on reviewing the survey data uh, at their next meeting. Or I'm sorry, at the. December 18th or 19th meeting, we're going to continue to brainstorm and develop short and long term solutions. And we're also connecting those to direct measures for success. So we'll know if the implementation measures are actually changing um, the situation and really focusing on what the situation was for the summer of 2017. Um, per the original direction, we'll be developing a pros and cons list for solutions, um, finalize a recommendation and bring those forward to you in March. 
So I, I think I, I really want to give uh, uh, <coughs> kudos to the task force members that are that are sitting there and pouring through some data and really tackling some difficult some difficult um, situations uh, while being empathetic to other situations. So um, I, I'd invite uh, if anybody, if any of the task force members want to speak uh, now, I think, or want to make comment, is that okay? That'd be fine. Anyone? Rick? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Rick Wheatner. Uh, task force member and honored to be on the task force. I will say that I am not used to um, government procedures and policies on how things are done. Coming from an entrepreneurial background, you usually just get together, do it, instigate it, and hopefully it works and you move on. So this is a learning experience for me. And I think the chief and Susan have been uh, great leaders in that regard. Uh, with um, Something that I have done out of just curiosity, and I'm not speaking for the group at all, is I've been asking merchants up and down Third Street two questions because I'm curious just how they feel about two things. And again, I have been not, the chief doesn't know about this, that this is totally on my own. The first question was, how would you feel if there were no smoking on Third Street? No one has said I'd have a problem with that. In fact, Everyone has said, I think that'd be great. Now, why do I bring that up? Because that is a behavioral issue that we are tasked to look at. It's behavior that would, uh, could affect the type of people that want to do other behavior that's not socially acceptable on Third Street. So ironically, it's been unanimous that merchants and, and shoppers or, or merchant uh, business owners and shoppers alike say, we would love it if there was no smoking. The second question I've asked, again, just out of curiosity, how would you feel if there were surveillance cameras positioned strategically around the downtown area? Not that would be monitored 24 seven, it's not like people are watching, but the deterrent that that would give to, to a perpetrator who was going to uh, do a crime of opportunity or a crime against real estate, knowing that they are being watched is a huge deterrent. So one thing I would ask, and then I'll finish, is would the city consider putting together an RFP, a request for a proposal, design build for a surveillance company to give us an idea of what it would cost? Design and install maybe five cameras, and then let the council decide whether that is too much money. Well, first, if it's a good idea, but then is it too much money? I've heard that cameras are too much money, but I haven't heard how much they'd be. So I think at the end of the day, no smoking and surveillance cameras could be a great deterrent in keeping people from doing the things that we don't want them to do downtown. Thank you, Rick. So, Anyone else uh, from the committee that would like to share a thought or two? Go ahead, Jeff. Yes, good evening, Mayor, Councilors, Jeff Sargent, Executive Director of the y, of YCAP. And uh, I wanna applaud Chief Scales and, and Susan for their leadership on this committee thus far. Uh, and, and I want to uh, continue to uh, support and emphasize the focus of the committee on safety and for including uh, individuals like myself representing our low-income neighbors in uh, McMinnville and throughout the county, that uh, the focus is on those who are jeopardizing safety. And Rebecca Kwan, when she came before this group at uh, a, a council meeting that had quite a bit of testimony a few months ago, she made the point too, that this is not about an issue of homelessness or of uh, particular types of people, it's about behavior. And, and I applaud that continued focus that uh, you know, myself, YCAP, other social service agencies continue to work very hard, obviously, to provide services to help people that are less fortunate, that are struggling to have a better future for themselves. And so, uh, they're victims to those bad actors that we are focusing on in this committee and focusing on providing law enforcement to address those bad actors and then continue to provide compassionate support to those people who need it. Uh, and so um, that's my focus and I appreciate the committee's um, opportunity to, 
to have that perspective because I think it's very important. Um, any questions? Any questions for Jeff? And I applaud the council's presence at this committee meeting, the mayor and uh, Councillor Garvin and Councillor Minky are, are, are there and at other committees that I'm a part of. And I think it's really important to have your presence and your perspective. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Any questions for Susan and myself? Thank you for your first update. Okay. And again, committee members, thank you for your time and your effort. Because there's many of you that are on dual committees trying to, to better this community, and we, appro we appreciate that so very much. Okay, that ends our presentations this evening. That takes us to our consent agenda, and our consent agenda this evening includes the minutes of the April 24th, 2017, November 14th, 2017 dinner and regular uh, council meetings and the November 15th special work session. Would, is there any councilors that would request to have any item moved off of our consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Okay. And second, it has been moved by um, Councilor Stassens and seconded by uh, Council President Menke. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay. The consent agenda uh, uh, is approved unanimously in favor this evening. Okay, that takes us to our resolutions. Uh, this evening, uh, our first resolution, number 201769, is a resolution of approving an out-of-calendar rate of judgment of 10% to most solid waste collection charges and freezing further rate increases until July 1st, 2019. I'll call on our city attorney, David Kosh, to, to make a, our presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is a uh, resolution number 2017-69, um, which uh, addresses two, uh, the first two of the three items that were um, uh, the, the subject of the public hearing that was held earlier this evening. Um, one related to uh, approving an out-of-calendar rate adjustment of 10% for recology for most solid waste collection charges. Uh, and the second item is placing a freeze on any future rate increases until July 1, 2019, in practical effect, foregoing any rate increase that might occur um, at the end of the current fiscal year. Uh, the uh, proposal that's before you um, uh, I think was well stated by Recology in the public hearing. I don't judge that I need to repeat that for the council. Um, and uh, I, I would note that uh, there was a question that came up uh, regarding the financials that were provided by Recology. Uh, the financials that were included in the packet that were received by the council are the, are the same standard financial documents that um, have been provided by Recology in association with their annual report and rate adjustments that they've come before the council with in the past. Um, that's separate from the issue of whether the, the, the city would at some point like to move forward with um, exercising its audit um, authority under the franchise agreement to do a deeper dive into the financials. Um, and that's not in the resolution tonight. It, it, it's, I think, uh, currently a, th a right that the, county, that, the, excuse me, that the city has within its franchise agreement. So I'm not sure if the council wanted to do that, that it would need to be included in this resolution. I think that could be done by separate direction to the, uh, to the city manager to, to see that that happened. Thank you, David. Uh, that brings us to uh, council discussion, and so I'll open our discussion. And again, we're dealing with the 10% rate, rate increase to take effect at the beginning of 2018, and we would have a freeze until July 1st, 2019. So I'll open that discussion. So, in, in this resolution is, is in response to the the. Um, uh, a relocation of, of waste to another location. Okay. I could start off, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, 
First, I want to say... You might want to hold yours up a little. <laughs> first, I want to say how much I appreciate the testimony that was provided today. It really <laughs> thought out um, and just there was a lot of heart in what was said, but also a lot of a lot of thought and um, statistics and... Um, I don't know, just exactly, I think what needed to be said was said, and I just really appreciate it. Um, this is something that uh, it's kind of been on my bucket list for a long time, um, and I'm just glad to see that, that the city's moving in this direction. Several years ago when we started talking about um, sustainability, the, uh, the landfill issue kind of just kind of crept up you know, it kind of rose to the surface as something that's kind of out there that is that is affecting our our, our long-term goals for the city and sustainability and livability. And I think moving forward in this direction, as was previously said many times, is the responsible thing to do. If if we have voiced our objection to that to it, the landfill being there, this is the this is the responsible thing to do, um, and is the uh, in my opinion the. Uh, uh, the conscious, uh, the uh, in good conscience, the best the best thing to do, and I think that a ten percent, in order a ten percent increase, to guarantee that we're not contributing to the problem is is well worth it. And I, what was heard from the council or to the council earlier in testimony from the public is that they they agree. So I would be supportive of this um, resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Any other discussion? Go ahead, Wendy. Um, I. Oh, sorry, Kelly, did you want to? No, 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 go oh, okay. ahead. I, I agree with Kevin. I feel like um, for McMinnville, for our citizens, um, the responsible thing for us to do is put, if we see that there's a problem and it's not benefiting McMinnville, then finding another alternative is a great way to support uh, moving away from Riverbend and um, support our tourism and the quality of life here. I think the 10%, uh, I would like to see if we can get more details w um, with regards to the financials. So I think we should take action on that. I think that's a reasonable request, but I'm in support of this uh, resolution tonight. So Thank you. I'm going to go to the phone. And Remy, would you like to weigh in on uh, the discussion? I would here. Um, so I, I, I kind of would echo what... Um, uh, what's been said both uh, by him and by Wendy. Um, so, you know, to me, it's not unclear at all that uh, the direction we've been heading, the um, the clear benefit to the city and the residents uh, of McMinnville um, far outweigh the costs, um, although that's not to say that those costs uh, could potentially be unburdensome or, or that, they, that they would go without burden for some um, because Without a doubt, uh, they will. Um, I, I do support moving forward um, with this. Um, however, I, I also just want to add that there was a specific request made by the council at our last meeting um, to bring back some more specific financial information, um, which we haven't yet received, as, as has been noted. Um, and I do think that uh, uh, council, or, uh, and I'm not sure of the correct uh, a protocol to go about it, but um, perhaps, Mr. City Manager, if that would come to you, I'm not uh, entirely sure, but I do think that um, that financial uh, information that has been requested by this council should be provided, whether that were to um, be supplied directly or if, uh, if an audit process is something that the council wants to engage in. But I, I do think that's a, an, an important component. I do think transparency is extremely important. Thank you, Remy. Uh, council President Mankey. Uh, I would echo what both Remy and Wendy have stated, um, and I am in favor of doing this. But I, I believe that, um, and you know, I believe in the past we have seen this return on investment in, you know, but it's been a number of years since we've actually seen it. But I would like, since it is part of the contract, to see perhaps a little bit deeper dive into the financials and also this reconciliation of return on investment uh, on a more regular basis, definitely by the uh, July uh, 
time when there might be a, a rate increase in July 2019, is it? 19, yes. Yeah. So that would be my take on it. Um, I don't know that there needs to be any amendment per se at this time, but since it is part of the overall agreement, it definitely needs to be, we need to take it a little more seriously because they are a monopoly and we do deserve to know what's going on. Thank you. Alan? Uh, I would like to see us <clears throat> exercise our audit uh, prerogative on that. It's not something we want to do all the time, but under the circumstances where the transition is so great right now, that would be a good time to, uh, and there is a change of leadership at Recology, that we do exercise that audit prerogative and get a closer look at the financials. So I'm in support, I'm supported that. I'm also in support of not sending any waste out to the landfill. And uh, just a lot of good testimony. There we go. A lot of good testimony today. Uh, the education that we receive from everybody's testimony really goes a long way. Really appreciate that. It did a lot for me, uh, understanding what's at stake here uh, for our community and for the uh, coming generations. <clears throat> and then also, uh, it's such a matter of principle to me as far as I think it was mentioned by a couple of those who tes testified today that, that it is a matter of principle if we're going to move forward and uh, develop uh, some of the programs that we've already put in place that we continue on that path and not be uh, one of the contributors to uh, this uh, mess, I'll call it out there, at the landfill. So uh, I'm in full support of that and uh, hope that we can come to an agreement on that, that we not send any more rubbish out to the landfill. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Adam, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, so initially I was concerned about the money that that our tip fee generates for the county and until I realized that that's very, very minimal. Um, you know, our, our city garbage generates about $30,000 a year for the county and, and a 10% rate increase for our constituents, I think is very minimal compared to what was portrayed in 2009 or 10 um, when it went to a vote. And with that all being said, it, I, I do know that it'll be a burden to some, but hopefully it will encourage them to to lessen their burden on the uh, the stream that is getting shipped out. And with that, I would be in support of in support of moving away from Riverbend um, under the condition that before another rate increase comes to us, period, there's an audit of the financials for transparency. Um, I know that takes time and so I, I don't want to hinge this decision on that but before July 1 2019 I would like to see a very transparent audit done thank you Adam uh, so I'm gonna peel two things off I think the ability to call for an audited statement um, with the franchise agreement I think we can instruct uh, Jeff to look into that and come back to us with a process that feels comfortable with Recology and the city and a frame, a time frame that fits within, and as Kelly indicated, that July 1st, 2019, because there will be that period of time where there's going to be, uh, I think, some settling downs of fees and cost and a, a better opportunity to know where we're at. But before we have an, the next rate increase to feel comfortable as a council that we've seen audited um, financials and then we understand that. So I'll turn that over to Jeff and, and have him take that on and get back to us at, a, at uh, a time where he's had an opportunity to dive into that. Okay, so that what that does then is um, I'm going to ask for an approval or a motion to approve resolution number uh, 2017-69. So Second. It has been moved by um, Councillor Stassens and seconded by uh, Councillor uh, Rudin. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Remy? 
It's on mute. It's on hold, I'm sure. Aye. Good. <laughs> we wanted to hear that for the record. Uh, any opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, resolution 2017-69 passes unanimously uh, six to six. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to resolution 2017-70, a resolution by the city of McMinnville expressing the interest uh, or the intent to be actually separated in its uh, PERS or Public Employee Retirement System account from McMinnville Water and Light Commission. Marsha, we'll turn that over to you. Marsha. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, counselors. On November 21st, there was a joint uh, meeting of the city and McMinnville Water and Light Audit Committees. Uh, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss whether the city and Water and Light should uh, separate for purposes of PERS actuarial valuations and accounting. Uh, there are several advantages to that separation, one being transparency and the ability of each entity to uh, calculate the true, no, understand the true cost of their PERS expenses because their rates would be different if they were separated. Uh, also, it improves the um, pension benefit reporting that we are required to do by governmental accounting standards and would uh, provide flexibility. Each uh, entity, the city and water and light, would be able to make choices going forward uh, uh, regarding how they wanted to fund, for example, a per side account. Um, so based on some information that was provided to us by PERS, we calculated what our PERS expense would have been if uh, the city and Water and Light had been separate employee employers. The impact on Water and Light is minimal. Uh, the impact on the city would be approximately 44,000 annually. All audit committee members agreed uh, to moving forward with that separation. And uh, the Water and Light Commission did pass a resolution on November 21st uh, indicating such. The resolution that's in front of you tonight is required uh, by PERS. Uh, both governing bodies need to uh, adopt this resolution indicating their intent to be separate employers. Um, if you uh, choose to adopt this resolution, we will forward both resolutions to PERS and the uh, rates that would be in effect with City and Water Light being separate employers would uh, be in, fact, in effect for um, the 2019-2021 um, biennium. So basically they would be effective July 1 of 2019. And, uh, um, Councillor Menke and Mayor Hill, you were at the audit committee meeting. If you had anything to add to that. Kelly, any thoughts? I, I think we've gradually been developing a, a more independent relationship with uh, City Water and Light. Um, I think this is important for what we might possibly do in regard to them uh, in our relationship with them over the next couple of years when we start doing our strategic planning i think it's a key feature so I, I personally think this is a good move and it certainly does simplify the purse calculation which i suspect is very complex so uh, I, I think there's generally very positive reasons to do this thank you kelly um i can speak on behalf of mcminnville water and light uh, number one both um uh, Marsha and Mark Dinsmore, they, their presentation to the audit committees of, of both groups was just su superb. It allowed us to really look and do a, a comparison deeper and better than I think we've ever done before. So uh, I think uh, the, um, the financial offices of the city and Water and Light to make that decision very easy. Water and Light, again, they're much like us. To, we have separate audits we have um, we have reporting statuses or uh, requirements now that make it much more complicated for us to being together and this just kind of pulls that apart and makes that uh, a very um, separate and easy going forward process and so water and light unanimously uh, voted to um, uh, 
agree on the separation. And so that's why we're before the, the council tonight. So I think what we'll do is open that up for any council discussions. I know we had a chance to talk about it at our, di at our dinner meeting, but any questions or comments? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve resolution 2017-70. I so move. Second. It's been moved by Council President Menke and seconded by Council uh, Member uh, Stassens. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed say nay. And Remy. Um, I am aye. Okay. And so. Uh, Resolution 2017-70 passes unanimously six to six. That takes us to um, ordinances this evening. The first re reading with a possible second reading of ordinance 5042. Um, we will now consider the matter of ordinance number 5042. Uh, Does any council object to having the ordinance read by title only? Okay. Will the city attorney please read the ordinance by title only? This is the first reading of ordinance number 5042, an ordinance amending ordinances 4904 and 5033 relating to the solid waste collection franchise. Okay. Um, and uh, Dave, anything you want to present more on this? Sure. Uh, so this is the third of the three items that were addressed in the public hearing this evening. Um, this one uh, relates back to uh, essentially a, a, a amending an ordinance that was passed by the council a few months ago, Ordinance 5033, which provided for an increase in the administration, uh, franchise administration fee that Recology pays to the city for the franchise. Um, during that action, the council approved an increase in the franchise fee from 3% to 5%, but phased it in in a two-step process. The first step went into effect October 1st. The second step, uh, from that, that was from 3 to 4%. The second step from 4 to 5% was scheduled to go into effect uh, July 1st, 2008, with the uh, resolution that was passed this evening increasing the uh, uh, authorizing the increase in um, uh, uh, waste collection rates for Recology, uh, it provided an opportunity to accelerate the franchise fee increase um, as it would be absorbed within that, that rate adjustment for Recology. So this ordinance would allow for the second step of the increase in the franchise fee from 4% to 5% to occur January 1st, 2018. Thank you, Dave. Any discussion from the council? Adam? Is this the only revenue we receive from that franchise agreement, or is there a host fee for the transfer station? Or? That is the only uh, revenue for in the, in the franchise agreement. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, um, I will ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5042 to a second reading. So moved. moved. Second. Okay, so uh, uh, Councilor Rudin and, uh, and then a second by Councilor Garvin. Um, those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And so um, ordinance number 4052 passes by a vote of six to six on this first reading will be brought before us for a second reading. Uh, uh, excuse me. <coughs> uh, it was unanimous, and so now I ask the city attorney to read the ordinance once again by title only. This is a second reading of ordinance number 5042, an ordinance amending ordinances 4904 and 5033 relating to the solid waste collection franchise. Okay, I'll ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 40 or 5042. So moved. Second. And a second. Um, uh, Councilor Rudin and Councilor Garvin seconded. Um, we will now ask the city uh, recorder to poll the council. Councilor Dropkin? Aye. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Councilor Jeffries? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Councilor Rudin? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. 
Um, ordinance number 5042 uh, is adopted by a vote of six to six. Thank you. That takes us to our second ordinance this evening, ordinance 5043. Um, we will now consider the matter of ordinance 5043. Does any councilor object to having the ordinance read by title only? Will the city attorney please read the ordinance into the record? This is ordinance number 5043, an ordinance amending title 17 of the McMinnville City Code specific to chapter 17.06 definitions and 17.55 wireless communications facilities to help achieve a more desirable community aesthetic while ensuring code compliance with current Federal Communications Commission regulations. Thank you, David. We'll call on Principal Planner Ron Pomeroy to, to present to the council. Welcome, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> members of the council. And... I do have a presentation for you. Is. Thanks for Ecology. Thanks, Adam. So thank you again for the opportunity to present this to you. Um, situation regarding wireless facilities in McMinnville is that we first adopted our wireless facilities chapter about 17 years ago. In June of 2000, um, over the last 17 years, the FCC has adopted a number of regulations that we need to take into account. Um, they've exempted things from some regulations such as personal wireless devices, cell phones, iPads, et cetera. Um, and they've also exempted um, particular um, administrative approvals for minor modifications to existing facilities. Our current code does not take that into account. So it's timely that we consider updating our regulations to main, maintain not only FCC compliance, but also to consider uh, zoning opportunities to achieve a better community aesthetic in McMinnville. The current requirements for wireless facilities um, allow the adoption of um, current regulations provided, oh, sorry. <laughs> It's getting late. Uh, the adoption of the ordinance that we do have in place now provided a good foundation. Um, and what it did though, is that it did allow wireless towers and in industrial zones without height limitations. Uh, current regulations also allow up to an additional 20 feet to be added to height to existing antennas mounted to structures in all zones. Uh, we do require landscaping around the base of antenna structures and other facilities and placement of antennas mounted to existing structures located in the historic downtown do currently require a get, excuse me, a conditional use approval. So some examples of the current installations we have for tower facilities in McMinnville, these are three that you've probably seen around town many times. Uh, and they are quite high, uh, 136 is the shortest on this slide show, excuse me, slide. Uh, we also have um, other towers in town. Uh, the one that's closest to this facility is at the fire department topping at 153 feet. Uh, the tower itself is always a little bit shorter, but then when you add the antenna facilities on top of that, it, it extends it probably um, eight to 12 feet additionally. We have current installations in the downtown area that um, are referred to in the ordinance as alternative support structures. Uh, third and four, there's one on top of the gallery theater and an old one over by the railroad tracks at Third Street. So again, these are considered as alternative support structures for antenna facilities. Um, so, what we are going to do is because the uh, recommendations to amend are extensive, we're recommending that we actually replace the entire chapter. And I'll recap what those are in brief. Um, there is an exemption section in the front part of the new recommended text, which exempts things such as cells on wheels for mobile broadcasting, uh, antennas used by viewers that receive TV or radio broadcasts, 
Um, also SCADA systems, which are utilized by the city in particular to monitor and manage pump stations. They re, uh, rely on a line of sight to communicate. And so they need to be exempted so they can actually be tall enough to function. Um, and also there are federal exemptions uh, that allow modifications to existing towers as long as they are minor modifications. We are adding section that deals with visual impact, which is not in the current code. Um, the height of new towers would be limited to 100 feet instead of no limit. Mounting on historic structures would require review by the Historic Landmark Review Committee. Uh, within the public right of way, all vaults would be undergrounded as much as possible and the ancillary equipment. Outside of the right of way, they would be limited to 12 feet in height and 200 square feet in area as much as possible, or they would need to go through a conditional use permit to exceed that. Uh, residential zones and the historic downtown district, all utility cabinets and similar equipment would also need to be undergrounded. And we also would prohibit all signs, symbols, flags, and banners, et cetera, that would be located or requ requested to be located on facilities, except when they are federally required, or if they are something like a flagpole that's in stealth mode. Uh, we have um, elements in the proposed text to address color that that being non-reflective and neutral colors unless something is federally required, such as in a location near the airport. Um, maximum height added to existing antenna structures and non-residential zones would be 10 feet instead of the existing 20. Uh, facade mounted antennas would be required to be integrated into the building architecture or otherwise stealth as much as possible. Uh, things such as roof mounted antennas would be set back as far as possible from the edge of the roof. Uh, we would require screening of uh, the ground facilities with a six foot tall fence required around the equipment and a 10 foot wide evergreen planting area. And also no artificial lighting unless that's something that's required by the FAA or other federal agencies. Uh, setbacks and separations we also address and are recommending that uh, the setback for the tower be equal to or greater than the height of the tower. And that would also include no guy wires being located within the setback area. We do encourage co-location as far as um, all existing facilities as much as possible. And no conditional use permit would be required in order to co-locate on existing facilities as long as there was no change to the type of tower or pole and the addition was visually compatible. Uh, co-location in residential zones that they would require stealth design as much as possible uh, and also accessory equipment placed within existing enclosures. So we do have an additional amendment to what originally went out in your packet, uh, and you do have a new copy of that packet uh, amendment in front of you, which deals with the floodplain and agricultural holding zones. Um, they were um, changed in the original, excuse me, they're changed in what originally went out to you to make those permitted uses rather than leaving them as conditional uses. But seeing as at some point, new lands may be annexed to the city and may have those zones applied to them. Uh, or at some point, the urban growth boundary may be amended through one or other processes. And those lands added to the city um, and these zones applied, we want those to be able to go through the existing conditional use uh, application process that currently exists. And again, that language is reflected in uh, the copy of the amendments that you have in front of you this evening. And these are examples of uh, stealth towers that exist in other jurisdictions. Uh, towers are not required to be stealth in McMinnville in the industrial zones, but these are examples. These are also examples of other smaller types of facilities. And um, as you can see, they can be a flagpole or art in some cases. Also architectural elements added such as the brick facility that you see in the center of this slide. Uh, again, there are some more um, architectural stealth examples. 
One thing that's added into the code is uh, a reference to a small cell facility. This is newer technology and it's going to be something that we see replicated throughout communities such as ours in the future. Uh, it's a way of repeating the signal and avoiding larger facilities. Those also can be stealthed, and in stealth mode, uh, as opposed to that, they look more like this. And that's something that the new language would also require. <clears throat> now, earlier today, we did receive a communication, um, uh, both a phone call and written communication from Verizon Wireless. You have a copy of that commu excuse me, communication in front of you. Uh, the main concerns uh, from Verizon Wireless relate primarily to small cells and their ability to uh, fit in residential neighborhoods under the recommendation, excuse me, under the recommended uh, code changes that you have before you. And they are concerned that they may not be able to provide adequate coverage in residential zones. And so they want time to take a look at that and provide some feedback to the city. Uh, they, in our estimation, uh, probably have some things that we should take a look at. Uh, the goal of these amendments is to provide aesthetically positive and also federally compliant opportunities for wireless facilities to meet the needs of our community as it grows. And the goal of the process itself is also to be transparent and inclusive of all interested and affected parties. And Verizon is requesting that we allow them the opportunity to participate so with that, uh, staff is recommending that the city council hold a public hearing on the proposed amendments addressing wireless communication facilities at their hearing, uh, excuse me, at their public meeting on January 22nd, 2018 to allow for additional public testimony to be considered. Thank you, Ron. You're Any welcome. questions for Ron? I got one. Go ahead, Alan. I've been trying to figure it out ever, ever since you talked about Ever since you talked about setbacks on these towers, mm -hmm. I don't quite understand what's it being set back from and there's no guy wires. Right, so it would be a setback from the property line and um, it, the basic reasoning is that if something should happen and the tower should fall, it would fall on the property that it is sited on and not fall across property lines onto other properties. Okay, so if it could be mounted on a building like most of these are, if it's a 156 tall tower, then the setback is equal at least to that amount. Is that right? Correct. Correct. And and those are particular to ground mounted facilities such as a tower. And the and guy wires or support structures. How does yeah. that work? And the guy wires are um, oftentimes part of the engineering required to support the tower, and they extend outward and anchor into the ground. And those would not be allowed to be within whatever the required setback for that zone is. Within the, no, they can't. They can, those guy wires cannot be in the setback. Correct. So they'd be outside the setback, which is outside the property line. No, they would be still on the same property, but just same not property. within the perimeter set back around the, the actual site. Mm -hmm. The tower itself would have to be set back at least the distance of the tower itself. So when someone's coming in for a proposal, their engineer has taken all this into consideration. They would need to, yes. And they're not going to present something that's going to get shot down because of setback. Yeah, we hope not. Okay, thanks. Uh, Ron, I have a question. I don't know if this is... Uh even a part of this, but you know, around town we see ham radio towers on residential property. Does this fit into this kind of uh, government regulation or is that a completely separate, this is more um, um, wireless communication uh, antennas? Yeah, it's actually kind of all under the same umbrella of communications, but this particular ordinance uh, would exempt uh, ham radio operators from needing to comply with this. Okay. There are some pretty big cam towers yeah. in residential areas, and they're they're okay. If you're saying. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other discussions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the amendments you came up with is this kind of standard for what cities have been passing? It seems really restrictive. It is uh, fairly extensive. It's a it's a far jump from where McMinnville <coughs> started 17 years ago. We looked at a number of cities. Uh, in particular, looked at Wilsonville as a model 
and then modified that based on legal counsel, some testimony that was received at the planning commission level, and also the particular characteristics of our city as opposed to Wilsonville. And that's where this set of recommendations came from. And Councillor Garvin, if I can just follow up on that, since there have been some recent FCC changes, there's a lot of communities going through amendments right now. Um, and with the new amendments to meet the FCC, they're also looking at stealth and aesthetics because there are some studies to show there's impact to surrounding property values and quality of life. So it's, it's finding the balance. Thank you. Um, Follow-up question would be, it seems now in the city, if, if one tower goes down, everybody with that provider is kind of SOL at that point in time, i.e. the last couple of years, AT&T has gone through that three or four times um with the setbacks that is proposed here it would seem that virtually no site within the city limits could have a big enough tower to to create redundancy within that network is that uh we for towers they are located or allowed to be located actually only in the industrial zones and we have uh, a fair number of very large industrial sites that would easily be able to accommodate these towers. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay. I can see why uh, staff's recommending a public hearing because I can see a lot of input from our community members on this, on this issue as far as height and mm -hmm. setbacks and stealth and anything else that is on their mind. So I'd, I'd support a public hearing on this issue. <laughs> Any other comments? Wendy? Ron, um, what were some of the changes that came out of the first round of public hearings um, from, like, what are, were some of the concerns addressed? Um, there were, uh, well, for one, a list of federal exemptions that originally we were not aware of uh, because we were utilizing a, a model from another city. And so we incorporated the references for the federal exemptions. Um, we also looked at, um, We incorporated actually language for small cell tech, which was something that was mentioned by Crown Castle, uh, which a representative from their company provided testimony to the Planning Commission. We met with them and um, worked through some of their concerns and then went and did research on what small cell tech looked like and the function of that and brought all of that section in. Uh, and you'll find that incorporated simply by reference. Uh, and then there's a piece that specifically addresses that. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. There were a number of other smaller amendments, but those, those were the two largest ones. Other discussion? Questions for Ron? Okay. Thank you, Ron. You're welcome. Uh, David? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, if it is the pleasure of the council based on the recommendation by staff, I would suggest that the, the appropriate motion might be to pass ordinance number 5043 to a second reading to be held at uh, your meeting on Tuesday, January 23rd, 2019, to be accompanied by a public hearing. So moved. Uh, I would move that with the exception of January 23rd, 2018 instead of 2019. That's probably good. <laughs> ah, good catch. Remy would catch that. <laughs> okay. She, she's wanted to do that for a long time, David. <laughs> catch it. Okay. Finally. <laughs> so we, ha we have a motion uh, by um, Council President Mankey. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Councilor Rudin. <laughs> All in, in favor of... Uh, of uh, moving uh, this ordinance to a second reading on January 23rd, 2018. Please indicate with a aye. 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 Any opposed? And so we will have a public hearing and move this to a second reading uh, Jan uh, January 23rd, 2018. Thank you. This takes us to ordinance. Oh. Remy, do you need to take off at 9? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. 
Mayor, is that all right, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, we have one more ordinance, and then just um, we have just uh, the, the, the the reports uh, from uh, counselors. We have a quorum. So the packet materials, and I support staff's recommendation. Thank, thank you, Remy, for your uh, diligence in being a part of this this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have the first reading with a possible second reading of Ordinance 5044. Um, we will be considering the matter of Ordinance 5044. Does any councilor object to having the ordinance read by title only? Hearing none. Uh, will the city attorney please read the ordinance into the record? Yes, Mr. Mayor, this is uh, first reading of ordinance number 5044, an ordinance amending the McBinville zoning ordinance specific to chapter 17.62 signs to update provisions related to the deadline of the amortization of certain types of existing non-conforming signs. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, we'll call on Associate Planner Chuck Narnell to present. And actually, Mayor and Councilors, um, Chuck has asked me to present this for him tonight. <laughs> I, I think, I think he's had a lot of signs. <laughs> um, so anyways, as a matter of background, um, this, this is a ordinance to amend a portion of our city code, Title 17, relative to our signs. Um, as a matter of background, in November 2008, the city adopted ordinance number 4900, and that amended the city code to, um, to adopt a signed chapter into the code, and it included an amortization process requiring non-conforming signs to be brought into compliance by December 31, 2017. As you know, we sent out notices um, for potential sign non-compliance non in June 2017 to 140 different properties. Uh, we did receive some business community opposition, and then we did also receive three legal challenges to the amortization process. Based on the, the legal challenges that we received, um, we uh, got together as an internal team and reviewed it and brought to you a recommendation that we extend the amortization period for another year to December 31, 2018, allowing us the time to do a, a risk assessment as to the amortization program and the risk to the city from a legal perspective. Also to look at the code and see if there's other tools that we can bring to bear to achieve the intent of the code, which is to reduce the overall size of signs and clutter of signs that are in the community. We've heard that very loud and clear from our community that we want to do that. Our recommendation is to tonight is to amend the code just to change that December 31, 2017 deadline to 237, December 31, 2018. It doesn't change anything else in the code in terms of the program or the code itself in terms of the signs and what's allowed and not allowed. It gives us the time to do the risk assessment. Um, we will also at the same time be doing some further research on what we would bring as recommendations to help the code move in the direction that the community wants to move it. Our, what we would like to do in terms of next steps is be able to have this dialogue and do this research so that we can con conclude this discussion by May 2018 because per the code, if we move into the amortization program, we do need to send out notice again to those potential properties who have signs of non-compliance six months in advance of the deadline to comply. So. Thank you, Heather. Uh, discussion among council? Questions for Heather? Just a comment. Um, Go ahead, Alan. We've got a great uh, ordinance in place right now, as we know. Uh, we just got a lot of work on the fringes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that's what this whole process is going to come to a head on and uh, get some traction for mm -hmm. these signs that are non complying. And what are we going to do? Because there's not a blanket thing to cover all of them. Uh, so, we're looking for some other avenues for accomplishing what we're looking to do is beautify the city. So. Wendy? Uh, I just wanted to follow up on the conversation we had at the dinner meeting. Heather, I think it's a great idea that you had to come back with us and we can have a strategic discussion to give direction to the planning commission so that we can make sure that it's a really productive <coughs> conversation and um, they know they know what we want them to do. So yeah, I'm and forward to doing that. we That's would great. welcome that. I'm sure they would welcome that as well. So okay. that'd be great. Any discussion at this end of the table? 
Hearing none, I just would like to weigh in again, um, coming in uh, through Newburgh last night late and McMinnville down 99, I still see such a difference in the signage in Newburgh and how clean and clutter-free that is. And you can see each sign and it's not like you're competing for space. And so I likewise would, you know, I think we have a, an ordinance in place that just needs to be tweaked a little bit and, uh, and bring into, into place some things that we didn't think about seven years ago. So um, I feel really comfortable with that. So with, uh, <coughs> with that, uh, I'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance uh, 5044 to a second reading. So moved. And a second. 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 It's been moved by uh, uh, Councilor Stassens and seconded by Ca uh, Council President Mankey. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It, this uh, ordinance 5044 passes on its first reading unanimously. And now I'll ask the city attorney to read the ordinance again by title only. This is the second reading of ordinance number 5044, an ordinance admitting the McMinnville zoning ordinance specific to chapter 17.62 signs to update provisions related to the deadline of the amortization of certain types of existing non-conforming signs. Thank you, David. I'll ask for a motion to adopt Ordinance number 5044. So moved. Second. And it has been adopt, uh, the motions by uh, Councilor Stassens and a second by Council President Menke. Um, I'll ask the city recorder to poll the council. Councilor Garvin? Aye. Councilor Jeffries? Aye. Councilor Stassens? Aye. Councilor Rudin? Aye. Council President Menke? Aye. Uh, ordinance number 5044 is adopted by a vote of five to five. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to the portion of the agenda this evening of advice and information, uh, reports from any counselors or committees on board assignments. Uh, I'll just start with Adam. Anything to update us? Uh, no, two scales and season covered it. And appreciate all the hard work you guys have done and all the heavy lifting. Kevin? Uh, nothing at this time. Kelly? Uh, we are meeting tomorrow morning at 10 for the affordable housing. Uh, as I look at the agenda, we're going to be discussing uh, action items of development incentives, SDC waivers, and we're also going to be discussing emergency shelter ordinances. So, um, and then uh, uses for the uh, DLCDTA grant, the housing needs analysis. So it's going to be a lively meeting, I suspect. Looking forward to it. Thank you. I'll go down to Alan. Uh, nothing to report, Mayor. Okay. Wendy? Uh, we had our meeting today with our architects to look at streetscape, um, preliminary streetscape uh, ordinance, ordinances for that area. We had a really great discussion, talked about how to address parking issues in those side streets, how to make sure that the trucks are able to the current use of that area requires that we have trucks, um, trucks that can pass through those streets and how to also tie it into the rest of the area. So there was great discussion and we gave them some direction to come back with some more details. Great. Good. Um, just the uh, bypass, we have now set the ribbon cutting ceremony. Well, let's put it this. It's going to be the completion ceremony with a ribbon cutting on December 18th, which is a Monday, 2 o'clock. We'll be at the Shehalem Creek Bridge. Uh, the governor will be there, plus as many of our uh, representatives and Congress, we don't know that they'll be out, but we've we've reached out to everyone to be a part of that. The bypass will not open on the 18th. <laughs> it will be a later date. We have a new um, we have a new, new region two leader. Uh, Lisa indicated to us that um, it will be sometime probably at the very first of the year. And what we're trying to do is anyone that would anyone that would love to be in the in in the parade that gets to start out and go through the bypass we'll let you know when that will be <laughs> but dave hogelberg in his uh, hot rod will be the first one that gets to zoom down but more information coming but if you can be a part of that it'll be a historic um, 
completion and ribbon cutting. Alan? The newspaper uh, article didn't, I couldn't find the location of that ribbon uh, cutting. I, I think but it's going to be the Shehalem Creek Bridge, which is right in the middle. They've got to find parking for everyone because we're not going to be able to get on the bypass for the ribbon cutting. But more information coming out. Or another article. Yeah, we'll, 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 give you, we'll give you plenty of heads up on that. <laughs> um, okay. Department head uh, reports. Uh, Chief? Ribbon cutting. Like Susan? All right. Think I'm Marcia? <laughs> Scott? We had a consultant down here on Monday looking at the system that's building. There's a few components showing their age. Okay. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Heather? Melissa? David? No, sir. Jeff? Thanks, Mayor, members of the council. So the executive team will be meeting at its uh, regular time on Thursday of this week, but uh, as opposed to our traditional meeting, we're actually going to be going through our first joint training exercise as a team. Uh, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator is a long-established uh, uh, assessment tool that assesses uh, a variety of uh, attributes and in individuals. Um, I'm sorry she left early. Joya Goodrum, the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, is certified to administer the Myers Briggs test, and she'll be doing that for the executive team this Thursday. We'll get to know a little bit more about uh, one another and a little bit more about ourselves, and looking forward to the experience. Thank you. Uh, again, um, we have uh, the uh, city county dinner has been moved to the 30th, if I'm not mistaken, for those that are still planning on going out to uh, Spirit Mountain. Uh, again, in your report, you have the building division report, you have the housing authority of Yamhill County financial statements, and the McMinnville R Rural Fire District financial statements. Uh, anything else that needs to be brought before the body? Hearing none, we will go ahead and close our council meeting.